Joining us now, Dr. Alex Barron. He is pediatric emergency room physician at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto and a pediatrician at Grand River Hospital in Kitchener, Ontario. And we're very glad to have you in that chair here tonight. Thanks so much, Steve. Uh, okay, let's tell this story. I guess a couple of years ago, you get the crazy idea that you want to go to Afghanistan. That's right. Where did this idea come from? Uh, well, it was born out of um, an interest that was sparked in me by a number of my friends who had been uh, as service men and women. And um, you're not talking doctors; you're talking these are soldiers. Canadian Forces soldiers, and also a number of uh, friends of mine who had been as adult trauma surgeons or trauma physicians who had gone to the Royal Three Hospital uh, in uh, at the Kandahar Airfield. And it struck me that a pediatrician had never been before, and that we were doing a tremendous amount of relief work in Afghanistan. And wouldn't it be a reasonable thing to actually have a pediatrician go there to assess maternal and child health? Makes abundant sense, which is why I'm sure you just called the Department of Defense, said, I want to go, and they said, here's your ticket, get on the next flight. Uh, the first part is yes. The second part <laughs> didn't actually happen. Um, again, you know, it's an interesting thing. I was extraordinarily naive when this whole process started, and I had been counseled by a number of my friends to approach the Canadian Forces, which I did. I literally phoned them in that way and uh, sent letters. And they were, I have to say, extremely gracious and very, very helpful. Um, but, but not fast. But not fast. Why not? And, well, because as it eventually turned out, one of the um, folks involved in recruiting physicians was very blunt with me in the end and said, Alex, here's the, here's the problem. How do we explain to the Canadian people if you go over there and you get killed? Uh, how do we lose a doctor at the hospital for sick children who's not necessarily going to be uh, treating our soldiers, because he said, remember, we don't have a lot of child soldiers in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And that made abundant sense. So then the recommendation was to change track a little bit and to try to go through the Canadian International Development Agency through CETA. And that's the, the way I did it. Did you not worry about being killed? Uh, it, you know, it's an interesting thing. It, I have to say it never occurred to me that that might happen. Um, mm -hmm. I was told by a number of people it might happen, of course. But I think in the, in the same way that most servicemen and women would say that it's not something that crosses their mind on a daily basis. You just have a compulsion to do what you want to do. Um, and I was very confident that the Canadian Force Escort would look after me, which they did. So from the first ask to the moment when you're actually on the plane going, how long a space of time was that? Uh, two and a half years. Two and a half years? Two, two and a half years, <laughs> many, many phone calls, many letters, meetings with um, ministers, meeting uh, with their staff, and finally the uh, a phone call literally from Bev Oda on a June morning Minister? saying, Minister Bev Oda saying, Alex, uh, it's time to do this and I'd like you to go. Is that a ridiculously long period of time to have to wait to make this happen? Uh, I mean, it sounds like it. I, I don't know all the workings of the Canadian forces in CETA. Um, all I can say is that I was extremely glad to get You're the You're being a good soldier to put it that way. Okay. <laughs> when you got on that plane, did you have any idea what would be waiting for you over there? Uh, again, I th you think you do, um, but a, a very good friend of mine, uh, Brian McDonald, who had been stationed in Afghanistan and who now actually is a member of provincial parliament in New Brunswick, he had talked to me about this and he said, Alex, I know there are people who are going to tell you that when you get there, uh, this is a country that is from the Middle Ages. It's not a country that's from the Middle Ages. He said, you are going to see things there that are biblical. Hmm. And at first I thought he was being dramatic. And then I realized by the tone of his voice that he was serious. Uh, and then I heard this from other people who had been there as well. And when I got there, I started to understand what they were talking about. Uh, it's an interesting place because in Kabul, for example, it's a very modern city. Uh, when you go into the rural areas, as we did, it is literally biblical. Like what? What did you see? Well, you'll see uh, shepherds and goats. Um, and you'll see mud adobe brick huts with uh, just uh, a large uh, open stove and a large pot of boiling water, which is part of the story that I did recently. Um, and, and that's it. There's no electricity, there's no running water, there's no sanitation. It's exactly the same as it might have been 2,000, 2,500 years ago. And where did you go to do what you originally decided to do? At first, uh, our mandate was to look at the services that were being provided in Kabul. And so we went to the major city, um, and we had the opportunity to meet with a number of uh, the folks who uh, were working at the major teaching hospital in Kabul. And also we had an opportunity to meet with some of the physicians that were working in some of the smaller clinics. And the most, I think, dramatic thing for me, though, is I had the opportunity to go to the Indira Gandhi Children's Hospital, which was quite, quite compelling. Uh, we saw things at the Indira Gandhi Children's Hospital that I would never have seen in North America. Um, 
and I have to say that the work that they're trying to do is really quite remarkable. You'd never have seen it because what, they were light years behind what we have here? Uh, entire wards of measles. Uh, a, a measles ward in Canada would be virtually unheard of, in North America would be virtually unheard of because we immunize against measles. Uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan, there are entire wards of 20 or 30 children, all with measles, and unfortunately many of whom are dying because measles kills people. Um, or we'd have entire uh, wards of meningitis, children all receiving treatment or trying to be receiving treatment for meningitis. Because again, they don't have immunizations against uh, the, uh, the causative agents of meningitis as we would in babies or older children in school. Now that's interesting because I think maybe our viewers would be under the assumption that what you expected to see come through the door would be war injuries, uh, kids who'd had you know, bombs fall on their houses. Did you see some of that? So that would have been in Kabul. We wouldn't have seen that in Kabul. When you get down to the Kandahar airfield and the Camp Nathan Smith, which is where the Canadian uh, base is, uh, which is about a 30-minute uh, ride outside of Kandahar airfield, about 45 minutes, that's when you start to see those types of things. So the people who are working at uh, Camp Nathan Smith in particular, they have to look after, of course, their first mandate is our Canadian forces, mm -hmm. But then their mandate is to look after, if they have the capacity, other individuals. And these can be individuals who have been injured by an IED, an improvised explosives device. Mm -hmm. Could be a child that stepped on a mine, because there are thousands of landmines there and thousands of children who are injured. And so the work that those folks have to do on a daily basis is, again, even, even I think, even more remarkable. Are you practicing in a, you know, what we would think of as a hospital? Uh, no. Uh, you know, it was interesting. I, I have a photograph um, of the Indira Gandhi Children's Hospital, and I was looking at it the other day, comparing it to the Roll 3 Hospital at Kandahar Airfield, where we have a CAT scanner and everything. So if one of our Canadian forces or American Canadian forces or any of the ISAF forces gets injured, they, uh, the, the general rule is if they can get them to the hospital, they'll survive. When you go out into the field, uh, the hospitals that are there for the local uh, Afghan children and, and families are very, very different. Uh, at the hospital at Camp Nathan Smith, it's, uh, it's an uh, accomplished emergency room, so they have everything they need, but there's no CAT scanner. Uh, there is no general surgeon who can get in there, or cardiovascular surgeon, if you've taken a bullet to the chest or that sort of thing. So their job is to stabilize, get to the Roll 3 hospital in, at CAF, the Canada Airfield, mm -hmm. and then that patient can get definitive treatment potentially there. That doesn't necessarily apply to those children, though. Mm -hmm. So they are doing everything they possibly can with the limited resources that they have. And again, it's nothing short of heroic, I don't think. I want to show some pictures, but before I do that, I want to take a moment to have you set these up for mm -hmm. two reasons. Number one, because they require some setup, and number two, because if there are parents watching with their children, mm -hmm. they may want to have the kids get out of the room now. These are yeah. graphic, graphic pictures, okay. starting with a little child. How do you pronounce the child's name? Masa? Masa, the little girl who uh, had been burned. Uh, what had happened with Massa happens with so many children in Afghanistan. Going back to these villages with the, uh, the adobe hut and the uh, pot of water literally burning on the stove, little girls and little boys learn how to walk by pulling themselves up, and every parent who's watching right now knows that. What little Massa did, unfortunately, is she picked that pot to pull herself up on, and she spilled the water. And okay. Again, graphic, warning. Let's see some of these pictures. And Alex, you can talk us through that. There she is. So there's little Massa, and uh, this is actually after she had received her, uh, her burn treatment. Uh, when she came in, she had about 50% burns to her body, including what we call full thickness burn. If you see her right shoulder, it looks on our left side, but that's her right shoulder. Uh, shoulder. That's a complete thickness burn. That goes all the way down to her muscle and to oh. her bone, and on her left arm as well, which isn't completed yet. And we've got a few more images here. And that's Samantha Parsons, uh, who is a wonderful uh, member of our Canadian Forces, feeding Little Massa uh, fluids by a syringe because she was so weak and dehydrated from the fluid that she was losing from her skin that she literally would have died. And uh, Samantha spent hundreds of hours, literally, hmm. feeding that little girl fluids. Oh. That's Little Massa when she first came in, and she's covered in a dye called gentian violet, which used to be in the, used in the First World War. It used to be thought that it would treat burns and stop bacteria from getting in. It doesn't. The old saying in the First World War was that if you were too purple, you didn't survive, and that little girl mm. is too purple. Is she alive? She's still alive, yes. And there's Little Massa again when she first came in, and she was being assessed by, that's Jamie Thibodeau, uh, Captain Thibodeau on the left, uh, who is in charge of the emergency room there. And the, uh, the in-charge physician. 
And I think we've got, we've got a couple of more. And that's uh, Felix, uh, Jelena. Felix uh, is a remarkable <laughs> young man. Felix would sing to Massa, uh, and he would sing to her over and over and over to keep her quiet because it was the only thing that calmed her. They had been to a local hospital earlier and been told to come back in one week if she was still alive. Oof. If she was still alive. And so they had given her nothing for pain. And there she was. And that's me, actually, out uh, on forward operations. Uh, Something tells me you don't dress team. for sick kids hospital like that. <laughs> no, no, no. You don't hmm. wear a flag jacket very often, though. No. Had you, I mean, you, you deal with all sorts of uh, terrible illnesses for children when you're doing your regular routine here. Have, yeah. Is this kind of what you're accustomed to dealing with? Um, I, I might see a child who's burned like that on occasion. Uh, but, of course, I would have the backup of having an entire team, including plastic yeah. surgery and other people, uh, to do what they need to do to save her life. And if she went into kidney failure, we could put her on dialysis. And if she needed more IVs, then we could put those. Those folks had none of those backups. So in fact, what happened was they were on the phone talking with one of the plastic surgeons uh, in Halifax, at the Children's Hospital in Halifax, um, who was extraordinarily helpful in making this all happen. So it was a telephone consultation. I think he was quite surprised. Uh, Dr. Thibodeau was one of his former medical students and called him out of the blue and said, you're not going to believe this, but I have this young lady here who's been burned. Mm -hmm and I need guidance on how to do this. And he provided that guidance and she survived. Now this is almost a year ago, right? Do you have any idea how she is now? Uh, my understanding is that Mass is still doing well. She's back with her family and um, she'll, unfortunately she'll have significant scarring. Uh, that nobody can change that. Mm -hmm. That would be the same for any child who'd gone through burns like that. Uh, but uh, she would not be alive. I'm very certain of that had it not have been for the remarkable efforts of that entire team that we just saw. And that's why you went. And that's part of the reason why I went was to document the fact that these, that these situations are occurring. And they're not just occurring on an occasional basis. These uh, situations are occurring on a very regular basis and sometimes and, and some, um, daily uh, to these folks. And they're responding the best way they possibly can. Uh, as I've explained to people, that family no matter what happens to them from now on, no matter what the Taliban says to them, no matter what anybody else says, they love Canada because they know that Canadians are good, Canadians are good-hearted, and that Canadians do the right thing. Those Canadians saved that little girl not because um, she was Afghan or any other reason, but it's simply because she was a little girl who needed their help. I, I genuinely don't want to be cynical about this. You know that. We know each other a little mm -hmm. bit. But uh, you've got that story to tell. And then, you know, and then there's what the Taliban does. And then there's the other stuff yeah. that happens in Afghanistan and the bribes that are paid out and yep. the warlords that do their thing. Yep. Do you think that the, the, the winning of the hearts and minds, as you obviously tried to do while you were over there, can compete with all of what else goes on in Afghanistan? Uh, a remarkably difficult uh, thing to deal with, of course. Uh, my sense of things is, though, that this, is, uh, that this has to be approached in one of only two ways. We either have to admit that this can't be solved and leave or we have to stay in and if we stay in we stay in for the long term and I don't mean long term as being one year or five years or ten years I mean this being two generations literally I mean supporting our aid workers to help these families for the next 30 40 50 years well how would you interpret what our Canadian government and for that matter the main opposition party have decided in terms of our commitment? I, I think what's happened is that over time we have underestimated exactly the, um, the commitment that's required in Afghanistan. And I have to say that I'm very proud of, uh, of our government uh, and I'm very proud of uh, both um, Minister McKay and Minister Oda for making those commitments and helping me, for example, and my team to get over there. I think part of the reason that that came about is because there is this ongoing recognition of how difficult this is and how much effort is required in this. And then, so now that uh, focus on maternal child health, which is really where we can win the hearts and minds of the Afghan people, I think that's the reason why we're focusing that way. Okay, you're proud of the government, but are you proud of the fact that we seem like we're bugging out next year? Uh, well, it will, we'll have to wait and see what happens with our aid workers. Uh, the military presence is one thing, and I'm not an expert on any of that sort of thing. But the aid workers, if we are, and I've seen them do remarkable things there, if we're going to continue, we have to find a way to support them. That means security for those individuals. Right, that's it military. Mean, it doesn't necessarily mean a combat role, but it does mean a security role for those aid workers. So we will need troops in that country to fulfill our commitments, I think so. as you see it, I think so. going forward for many, many years. Well, whoever provides those troops, someone will have to provide troops if the, if the aid 
programs that have been established or need to be established are to continue and be successful. There's just no way around it. Alex, one more question. You want to go back? I would go back tonight if, if I was given the opportunity. Um, it's just a question right now of, uh, of some logistics. I know there are uh, some plans to look particularly at pediatric services and a pediatric program. I've had some conversations with some folks in CF and I've had some conversations with folks at CETA as well. And uh, if they needed someone to be the coordinator of that, I would jump in tomorrow morning. And we thank you for coming here tonight and telling us all about it. Thanks Alex Barron. Thank you, Steve.